as well. Um, we have a slightly unusual uh, for us, at least today's schedule. So after the poster session, starting at 2.30, we will have a text mining workshop. And we don't, we, that's a new thing for us. We're experimenting a little bit with the way we organize the meeting. So uh, those of you who are interested in text mining, don't, don't forget to come at 2.30. And uh, also, we're doing these uh, Terry talks, which are uh, slightly longer than our usual talks, uh, invited uh, speakers on a wide variety of, of different topics this morning and tomorrow. And we're going to start off with one that I think you're really going to enjoy from Dennis Wall at Stanford University. Dennis. Ryan, would you hit? I think it's just minimized. All right. Whoa. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. This is an honor. I'm really excited to be here. I love this conference. Today I'm going to talk about AI-driven pediatric developmental health, or brain health. <clears throat> the reason why I want to talk about this is because brain health is arguably one of the biggest global health burdens we face today. In fact, it's bigger than cardiovascular cancer. It accounts for 28% of disability-adjusted life years worldwide, at least that much. And if you fix it early, you fix it later. So if we focus on the developing child, we can change the progression and create a much more positive long-term prognosis for the individual. And arguably, one of the best areas to start and focus on in that space is autism. It's comorbid with many other conditions, symptomatically overlapped with a number of different developmental and pediatric conditions, as well as long-term mental health conditions. In addition to that, <clears throat> it's dramatically on the rise. It's risen over 600% since 1990. It impacts now one in 40 kids. It's behaviorally diagnosed today only despite the fact that we know it's genetic. We haven't figured out the genetics, and we're working on it aggressively right now. But for now, the, the state of the art remains a behavioral diagnosis. And it's significantly male, but as I already indicated, it's incredibly costly to the healthcare ecosystem. It's particularly ripe for innovation. With this one in 40 now, it represents probably the biggest global pediatric, pediatric health challenge. It's basically an epidemic. But if you, if you intervene early, you can change the progression of the, of the child dramatically. In fact, if you intervene early enough and before the age of eight, you can actually reverse the symptoms to the point where the child no longer qualifies for an autism diagnosis. This is super exciting and um, has been written up years ago now as one of the top 10 innovations, but we haven't realized the impact of this innovation. It hasn't taken effect at this point in time. And the reason for that is largely because the current healthcare system has established a series of steps that basically create huge bottlenecks, wait lists that are now 18 months long for a diagnostic evaluation, 18 months long for access to therapeutic services, which are gated, at least reimbursement for them, are gated by the diagnosis itself. So just over here to show you what I'm talking about, one in six kids present with a developmental condition. All of those kids must progress through the same developmental medicine specialists and undergo the same testing that include cognitive tests, academic psycho psychoeducational tests, speech tests, behavior rating scales, and ultimately all of that comes down to a diagnostic decision, but this takes hours and costs thousands of dollars. Once that's done, they can undergo, they can qualify for therapeutic intervention, but by the time they get there, they've already lost opportunities, and many of them have passed through the windows of developmental brain plasticity where the interventions can have the biggest impact. So this is a crime, and we're trying to fix it through a number of different digital vehicles, uh, ubiquitous technologies and approaches in that space that are enabled through AI to make a difference. As we, but the good thing about this uh, standard of care is that it has created a treasure trove of medical record information that we can mine through the, through the lens of machine learning. There are two gold standard instruments that have been used almost unanimously in the process of arriving at an autism diagnosis. One is the ADOS, the other is the ADIR. You don't need to know what those are, but just know that they are standard exams that are common to the field. What's interesting is that doctors will tell me, that's a DIN, sorry about that, that 
they can hear autism as they walk from their office through the waiting room to the clinical diagnostic evaluation room. They can actually hear it. They have this intuition, but they don't act on the intuition. And so what we're trying to argue in the research that we've been doing is that we can create a vehicle, a video phenotyping vehicle that's mobilized that enables them to act on their intuition. <clears throat> so to start, we mined, sorry, we mined 18,000 medical record data from these two gold standard instruments using machine learning. Very simple standard evaluation where we're basically asking, can we reduce the complexity of the autism diagnosis without loss of accuracy? And using the lens of machine learning and some basic principles that I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar with, such as using balanced measures of performance, uh, tending to go with simplicity and parsimony, fewer parameters, more regularization, sparse models, but making sure those models are interpretable so they can be utilized in the clinical setting. The goal here being reduce the complexity of the diagnosis without loss of accuracy with an interpretable model that can be utilized efficiently in the clinical practice. So we've done this a number of times using a standard set of classification families, general linear models, nearest neighbors, linear regression, tree-based methods, and so on. All, in all cases, we're trying to use sparsifying coefficients. One is basically minimizing the number of features that are used, indicated here, and the other is maintaining a standard error that's no further than one away from the best performing model. When we employ these sparsification parameters, we can arrive at our goals. It's a high accuracy, simplistic model that's interpretable. <clears throat> Doing this in a standard grid search fashion, we can arrive at a set of features that are, are consistent across a number of different models that have high accuracy, and then we can use those, of course, in uh, the testing uh, of the models themselves. Just to note, which is interesting when I talk to clinicians, that as you actually increase the number of, 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 of features, you reduce the accuracy. You actually get further away from your goal. And I show this to my clinical friends who are performing diagnostic evaluations to say, not only are you asking too many questions, the more questions you ask, the further away from your, your, your goal you're getting. And importantly, I've told you some interesting standard pr processes to arrive at models, but it, you know, the, the models are only good if they are short and interpretable. And, and in fact, when you study these models, when you study these data, the models that you can derive from them are very short, very minimal, very sparse. So we can reduce the complexity from the standard evaluation, which takes about 10 hours and includes over 200, 200 behaviors that are measured, to a total number of about seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven features that are required to arrive at the same level of accuracy, we think, as the standard autism diagnosis that's derived from the clinician. <clears throat> so we've tested, and the test performance against held out data is at 99.9%. This is exciting, it's tantalizing, this is an aha moment for us. We wanted to make sure that it worked well in the younger kids because that's where it matters the most. I already indicated that therapy is impactful when it's delivered early, and in fact it does. The AI score that we're getting from the models that we've derived aligns with the clinical diagnosis with a very high frequency, which is indicated obviously here. And you know we could project out the negative and positive predictive values when we think about the differences in prevalence from the standard tertiary care centers out to the more primary care centers where the prevalence of autism is significantly lower. And there the accuracies remain high and within a clinical uh, threshold of acceptable. We do independent clinical tests, which we have done. We've done these on additional replicate data from EMR. And we find, again, that this classifier score that we can generate from, um, from the models derived from these, these standard instruments is, is, uh, is very, very consistent, very high, very reliable. Sensitivity and specificity where, oh, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. Sensitivity and specificity, again, in the 90s. Really exciting. but. I'll get, so I'm going to get to the next more exciting stuff in a second. We, d we did this over the last six years, building models from these EMR data. And we've come up with eight total models. And these have, obviously, some overlap. And in total, when we look at the total features that are um, picked out from these different models and, and different experiments, we have a total of 30 features, some of which are used multiple times across the different models. <clears throat> 
So, so what? So we've, we've, we've published papers about these, these, these features. We've shown that we can reduce the complexity, at least in an academic setting. We haven't shown how we can deploy what we've learned into an instrumentalized process for faster diagnosis. So what we've hypothesized is that we can tag these features quickly in home video, just like this one. Videos that are provided directly by the parents. Tag them using non-expert raters in a way that's fast, efficient, and repeatable. <clears throat> so to test this hypothesis, we crowdsourced the acquisition of a few hundred videos, uh, on average three minutes in length, very variable in quality, just like a YouTube video. With nine, and then we, we deployed nine analysts. This, in this case, we're talking about basically high school students or college students. You know, they don't even have a really good concept of what a, a normal kid looks like. But we can sit them down in front of terminals and have them quickly tag these 30 features from the models and ask about iterator reliability and accuracy. <clears throat> because once they've created those feature tags, we can run the models, get the outcome, and align it with the clinical diagnosis and see if it works. And it looks just like this. And Maya, would you hit that little thing? Just so you can see it in action. It's essentially a mobilized terminal. We sit them down independently. They're looking at these videos, tagging these features really rapidly and using their intuition for the most part if they don't understand or if they don't see a specific feature present in the video. <clears throat> this kid is pretty typically autistic. <clears throat> First thing we wanted to find out was do we have to use nine? You know, we want to be able to deploy this in a crowd setting, so do we have to use nine people all the time? Well, it turns out the answer to that is no. We can use as low as three because the difference between three and nine when we take a look at one of the model's performance is, is negligible, it's insignificant. So we've argued that three is the number that you can achieve um, a majority rules consensus, the minimal viable number of raters required to, re to achieve a majority rules consensus on the diagnosis. <clears throat> More importantly, uh, when we take those three and we, de we deploy the methodology, we don't see a great deal of inter-reader reliability issues. We see, in fact, that for the most part, the diagnosis agrees almost 100% of the time. These are behaviors down, uh, sorry, behaviors on uh, the, the y-axis, and then you look within each of these behaviors, you see subjectivity shifting. There's differences in opinions uh, by each of the raters, but those differences are never big enough to cross the diagnostic threshold. So we don't violate the diagnosis, even though there's some disagreement about the severity of the phenotypes, as you'd expect. And we're highly accurate when we run these models, even more accurate than some of the tests that we ran on the EMR data. Now we're looking at live information coming from the public of kids who are at risk for or already achieved, uh, already have an, uh, an autism diagnosis. And we see 94% sensitivity and 78% specificity in a consistent fashion across a series of clinical tests that we've run. And this is not with all 30 features, in fact, it's with the model that contains only five features. It's effective at younger ages. We have an AUC of 0.94 with kids between two and six. The window where we need to be operating, in particular between two and four, where we have to be diagnosing very efficiently and getting kids on therapy. And we can go very fast. On average, about five minutes, median, four minutes, an evaluation of all 30 videos for all these different videos, and uh, all 30 features for these different videos. And so, you know, within four minutes, as opposed to, again, 10 to 17 hours, we can achieve the same level of accuracy that you can get in the clinical setting. So, we're just summarizing this. We have a mobile video upload, three raters scoring these videos, scoring these videos for all 30 features across the eight different models, one of which we believe to be optimal within four minutes, achieving an accuracy of about 95% um, sensitivity and 77% specificity. But this, there are other models that are good, too, and this suggests the possibility that we can stack these classifiers, not just to arrive at the autism diagnosis, but to enrich for a, a population of kids who are developmentally delayed. And with that, we can do different. The key thing about this, though, is like, not like a lot of medical practice today, in this setting, with this kind of model um, approach, like using a phone, we can, we can simultaneously render a decision while generating data that we can use later to build better models. So in the process of this arriving at the autism diagnosis using models like the ones I just showed you with three raters providing input, those raters' input become a video feature matrix on which we can operate to build a different model that's video feature specific. 
<clears throat> and we can do this iteratively over time, creating this action to data feedback loop that is incredibly important, I think, for healthcare going forward, especially with the opportunities we have using ubiquitous technologies like phones. So this slide is meant to indicate in some real data that we've just generated <clears throat> that we can study this matrix, which is the video feature matrix I just described, to build a new model. And that model has incredibly high accuracy, it's in, but it's independent of the standard of care instruments that we use to derive the models in the first place. It's now tracking away from it, moving in the direction of being specific to video, which we think is probably more, more useful within this context. <coughs> so quickly, some ingredients for success. <coughs> in particular, I think when you have a ubiquitous technology like this, using video that's input from the stakeholder, from the parent, from the you know, of the child who's in question in real time, we can operate in real time to test and retest to build better models. Um, sorry. And ensure functionality and generalizability. So I think in general this process is something that we can repeat for many other, uh, many other conditions, in particular within um, the pediatric space. So we've solved one bottleneck, we think, with this mobilized video phenotyping. We have decided to focus on the other bottleneck because we, if we're really good at diagnosis, we might even create a bigger bottleneck on the other side and getting access to therapy. So we don't want to do that. But like with the diagnostic procedure, we think the therapeutic space is particularly ripe for opportunities in developing digital technology solutions, <clears throat> which we have done. Note that autism suffers, uh, the standard symptoms include eye contact issues, recognizing emotion issues, engaging in social interactions. Today the therapy uses flashcards, literally a one-to-one -one relationship between clinician, care provider, and child, showing flashcards to reinforce that child's understanding of specific emotions. Very Pavlovian, in fact. It's called discrete trial training. Not naturally, this doesn't scale well. It has issues with generalizability, especially if you know, the angry face is a bearded individual, so the child maladaptively asso associates beardedness with angriness, which happens very frequently. There are many issues with the, sy the system that we can probably fix. Um, this is what Darth Vader uses. <clears throat> and so I was reading this article about a pimp uh, getting wet at a sentencing. I'm just kidding. Sorry, nobody likes that joke. I like that joke. Anyways. <laughs> it was really funny because the, high, the headliner was above Sergey Brin and, you know, anyways. <laughs> so they pulled glass as a, as a technology. And that was opportunistic for us because the moment they did, it freed up the opportunity for us to call them and say, hey, will you give us some glasses? And they did. Um, these are great because they have this augmented reality form factor that doesn't distract the child from their real environment. It provides an opportunity to train the child in real time emotion recognition. We can take advantage of this peripheral monitor and the outward facing camera to capture the world around the child who's wearing the glasses and to teach that child exactly what's going on with faces. To look to faces and understand what those faces are telling them. And when we do this, we capture a great deal of that discrete trial training that's effective. But we do so in a natural way in their natural environments. So we've cr created some computer vision technology to dynamically track the face and, thank you, Maya, and to perform real-time emotion classification and send feedback in real time to the child to say this is a face and this face is a happy face. What we do in the process of this is again instrumentalize, or insta I'm not even sure if that's a word, create a data, uh, sorry, an action to data feedback loop through which we can provide something actionable to the child in real time. This is a face, this is a happy face while capturing data and use those data for be building better models down the road. We're capturing thousands of frames, thousands of hours of images thousands of hours of video data as people wear these glasses. <clears throat> and we can send those video data to um, convolutional neural net exercises and a number of other things. What we can do also is create a holistic therapeutic intervention program where we can provide a parent review directly on the app. <clears throat> so we've done this, we've, we've tested it in a number of different ways, including in randomized controlled trials. And I just wanna quickly show you um, some of the results from that. The, uh, the field of psychiatry, child psychiatry, child psychology, like many other fields, you know, suffer from good endpoints, outcome measurements, but we've used the best that we can to be able to judge the efficacy of these devices objectively in these standard trials that we've run. One of them is the social responsiveness scale, <clears throat> which is shown here. Lower scores are better. Um, and so with 14, in, this is just showing you a subsample of the number of individuals we've tested with. We've tested on over 160 at this point. Um, 
you see in, in all cases actually a, a decrease, a, a positive trend in the child's social responses, the child's socialization score essentially. Are they getting better at making face contact? Are they getting better at being aware of their social environments and recognizing emotions? The answer is definitely yes. In fact, some of these kids do so well that they no longer qualify for an autism diagnosis. You see some of these kids are dropping below the threshold for the SRS that would qualify them for an autism diagnosis. <clears throat> this is exciting, tantalizing, we think it works. Importantly also, kids qualitatively love it, and that's why we've decided to call this superpower glass because all the kids said, oh, this is like I'm putting on a superpower. And they only wear it, by the way, for about six weeks. It's 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, three times a week for six weeks. And after that, they seem to no longer need it and have improved, at least on these scales that I've, I've shown you. Okay, but a wearable, you know, can have limitations. And so we wanted to go beyond just the wearable and try to take advantage of other form factors, including the phone, again, going back to the phone, <clears throat> for a couple of reasons. One is because we, we, want us, we want to facilitate the process of video acquisition to make the video diagnostic faster and more efficient, but also we want to become unfettered if possible from the glass wearable because Google may no longer manufacture it and the AR revolution may not happen and there are a number of things that we want to be mindful of if we're going to productize this and try to ship it to the global community that needs it. So you may be familiar with Ellen DeGeneres' Heads Up game. You ever play this? <clears throat> so that you put the phone on your forehead, it's a charades game, video is switched on and it, like, it shows you an image like a lemur and you're supposed to act at a lemur which I think would be pretty hard. Um, and if you get it right, if the person guesses it correctly, they can put the phone down. If you can't get it, they skip and put the phone up. We decided to make a heads up for autism called Guess What? Because we couldn't call it heads up for um, copyright issues. <clears throat> and it's a really simple solution that does a lot of what Glass does, but puts the camera on the other side, essentially flips the camera around onto the child. And we could show the child an emoticon, an emoji, uh, an emotion face like the one that's shown here and the child's job is to act it out. And what we get there not only is the child's ability to socialize but we get the child's ability to imitate and the imitation is, is, is in effect tantamount to the child's physiological understanding of the emotion itself. So we get more than we can get from glass probably. But we also get a video as we do. <clears throat> this creates the opportunity for us to um, get a number, uh, hit on a number of important therapeutic uh, uh, pieces like eye, making more eye contact, increasing social awareness, and a number of other things while capturing data. Again, an action to data feedback loop and a very effective one that utilizes very simple prompts like the one shown here. <clears throat> and sometimes we try to scare the kids so they can emote angry, I mean, or, or, or <laughs> surprised or fear, like this is the it clown, super scary. I'm only kidding, we don't use this. <laughs> But what it really does do is create an opportunity for us to uh, automatically label image data in real time. So the moment in time where gameplay corresponds with um, an emotion classifier outcome. We already have an emotion classifier. We built it for glass. We can deploy it here. And the moment where that classifier, its outcome corresponds with the game epoch, whether it's a happy or an angry face, is the moment in time where we have two point correspondence, an automatic label for that specific stream of images. And we could deposit those, even if they're weakly labeled, into a database that we can use for convolutional neural net development. <clears throat> this is exactly what we're doing now. We can build nets that are more efficient at recognizing emotion in kids' faces <clears throat> and build up the, the armamentarium of data for computer vision to make it possible to do more than we can today because a lot of the image databases are uh, still uh, not large enough or not, uh, not well labeled enough to make some of these models possible. <clears throat> so, what I've just told you represents some examples from a, a paradigm <clears throat> in uh, translational bioinformatics that, that I created that I think is important and, and provides a framework for thinking about developing new technologies for healthcare. Uh, it essentially contains three axes, a signal axis, a sensor axis, and a platform axis. And you want to walk your way up all of these axes. So you want to move from rare to ubiquitous. So think of an MRI machine moving to something much more efficient, like a phone that can do better um, or an eye tracker that can, you know, moving from the clinical eye tracker to a phone-based eye tracker, moving from an active platform where you're talking about, you're requiring a great deal of input and engagement from your constituent to a more passive data acquisition platform. 
and moving from subjective behaviors, uh, subjective measurements like behaviors to more objective behaviors. <clears throat> and you know, thinking about this creates opportunities for us to look at technologies, ubiquitous technologies that are out there that have sensors that can capture signals in a way that's much more ubiquitous, in a way that's much more passive, and so on. <clears throat> and so this is happening in the field, and I think I can do this in one minute, which is about all I have. <laughs> there was a really great um, special topics for machine learning and health that came out in PLOS Medicine just last month. We published there um, with a, a bunch of other fantastic papers. I, can, I encourage you to take a look at it. We published some of the work that I just showed you. And some of the things I just showed you, we've licensed to a company called Cognoa, <clears throat> which is taking these things forward and trying to actually put them into practice. And they're doing this in a way that's important, um, uh, 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 important to recognize, which is maintaining an ongoing dialogue with the FDA, which, which has already created some innovation action plans and policies around software as a medical device that are, I think, really, really important for taking what I've shown you and things like it from academic to uh, actual practice. And, and so, you know, we can move along this continuum. And a few companies actually have already started to do this, and I'll show you a few examples in a second. <clears throat> Some key pieces of, of advice that we've learned as we went, as we've gone along with this process. Early dialogue with the FDA is critical. And so Cognoa, for example, has, has been given a breakthrough designation for the video diagnostic. And with this, they can have an active dialogue to make sure that the clinical studies that are done are effective and the endpoints that they've used are going to be <clears throat> uh, consistent with what the FDA needs to see to regulate the device so it becomes something that can be used in practice much more frequently. There are other platforms like Cognoa, and this includes Achille, which is a game for ADHD, Ginger.io, which, uh, which is a depression inventory. A lot of these are now in the, uh, a lot of these companies that are within this uh, space or working within mental health. But as I said, mental health is one of the key areas that you want to be working. <clears throat> and finally, a company like Doc, Doc AI has some interesting um, uh, technologies quite like this. And just to give you a few examples, they're using AI to predict steps and healthcare visits and a number of other things. One thing that I like a lot that you guys should check out is this medical selfie because it provides this action data feedback loop that I've already talked about. So I took a f selfie of myself. That's a really bad picture, sorry. And you know, it gives me a quick update on my age, my sex, my height, my weight. The cool thing about this is that if it's wrong, you want to fix it. And by fixing it, you actually update the model. And so this is a nice and fun way to create an engagement platform that, that engages your constituent to help build better models for healthcare going forward. <clears throat> so there is no medical research without you. I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. Uh, this is this is quite quite remarkable. I mean, it, it, the, the the concept that many of these kids are no longer on the spectrum is is remarkable. And my question is about the long term impact of that. In other words, does it go away after a month? Are they now cured for life? Is it, you know, basically, you know, they're learning some skills, but then is it simply that they never had the opportunity to learn those skills and now they've learned them and it, that's it? Yeah. It's a one-time sort of learning experience? Or is it that as they grow older and they have to detect more subtle social cues, they will again have a disadvantage to which you will have to have another intervention to teach them those? So could you comment a little bit about <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, every, everybody's, everybody develops differently is, is, is one answer to this. So we, we can't promise that this is some sort of panacea. It's definitely not that. But what it does do is makes, it, it, during the child's window of brain development, where this can be the most impactful, it makes the kid aware of their social environments where they would otherwise not be. So they might be you know, in, in the room, off in a corner, fingering the, toy, the, the wheel on the toy bike that they have, as, as opposed to engaging with their parents or their siblings. This takes them from that world to the social world. And we think it unlocks a layer of the on onion, essentially. So once we've sort of made them ap appreciate salience of emotion, Right? They understand there's something cool in faces. They start to focus on that more, and Very in cool. so doing become, become more likely to progress independently on their own, and they do. So we have some RCT data that has shown that they maintain the high levels of change uh, consistently six weeks out. So it's a follow-up study.
thank you for a very fascinating talk. Um, I was actually curious, I mean, given the complexity of the phenotypes, how, especially in the crowdsourcing environment, how exactly do you define the controls? That's, that's one question, I have a second one to follow, but how exactly do you assess the controls? How do we de how do we assess? How do you, what, what are your controls? Like how do you give yeah, them? It's a great question. The range and phenotype. Right. So <clears throat> um, we've been able to get video data for a wide range of controls. First, we started with the typically developing controls, which is easy, right? They're polarized, right. and so that. But you know, m maybe more typical of the general pediatric population, where we have a high negative predictive value, right? But we've gone on to get video data from uh, partnerships with different developmental medicine centers and kids who have speech and language delay, ADHD childhood schizophrenia, a number of other conditions that are often confused with autism. And so we did that, of course, to challenge the specificity directly, to see how specific can we be about the autism diagnosis. Um, so we, we've been able to do a lot of clinical tests across the kind of developmental spectrum. And, um, and, and my other question actually was, again, related to the sort of given the complexity of the phenotypes. One of the things um, I was curious about is that you had essentially a supervised set of pre-existing, maybe expert curated kind of features. Mm -hmm. But in terms of have you been able to do unsupervised extraction of novel features that may not have been captured that are left out because of biases in the, in the previous literature? Yeah, it's exactly. And I, it w the databases haven't up until now been big enough to do that, but now they are. And so the videos that we're acquiring actually make them accessible for those sorts of experiments. Whereas before, we're really hamstrung by the numbers and also by the, you know, by the measurements made on the individuals that we have. And okay. so I think going forward, we will be able to do that increasingly. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, it's very interesting to uh, see how you can do video tagging for diagnosis. Um, but uh, kids with autism grow up, and uh, they go through puberty, and they're never on just one treatment regimen. And uh, they can become anxious, very anxious, suicidal. Um, is there an idea or have you thought about actually monitoring or tagging videos they're watching, like on YouTube? So with autism, you know, kids have social defeat, they're by themselves, but uh, they're on their phone um, and they're looking at videos on YouTube. And uh, a video on YouTube could be something that's not so dynamic. You can uh, very rigorously or carefully tag um, to get a sense um, of on the treatment they're on, are they feeling suicidal? What are they watching? Are there cues there that can mm. Yeah. Tell the parent yeah, it's oh, important. you need yeah. to uh, work with your physician on changing your medication, your dosage, et cetera. Yeah, that's a really important question. I mean, we're not working on it, but, but colleagues um, are, ha are, are beginning to work on, on it now, including Tom Insel. Um, uh, from, he was previously director of NIMH and now is working at this company called MindStrong, and they're working on later onset conditions, in particular suicide and depression. And I think you know the ubiquitous technologies that we talked about here are definitely employable, employable there. I think that that's a space that needs to be actively looked at. We're not doing it right now. Hi, Dr. Wall. I had a quick question about um, the raters and the protocol for them to actually assess these features from these videos. So given the nature of the basic training, like you said, they were high schoolers and of course not subject matter experts, was it challenging to design that protocol as to how you wanted them to rate and tag these videos or would it have been somewhat the same if you had like subject matter experts in an ideal situation? Yeah, it's a really good question. We did include subject matter clinical experts in um, a bunch of the experiments really to spot check the quality provided by the raters. I, it's really sort of a joke about the high schoolers. We do a little training. It was all we could afford actually at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Students would work for free. Um, but, uh, but it turned out to work well, and we think it's important because it enables crowdsourcing, right? So we've actually started, okay, I'm gonna stop. That's my answer. Josh, do you have a question? Sorry, <laughs> oh, cut me off. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. I thought you were cutting yeah, me off. Yeah, it is pretty quick. Uh, I, just, I was just wondering, Dennis, are the data sets you talked about joint in the sense that you've got this, these annotated features for subjects for which you're trying to intervene and if so, yeah. if there's a variable, if the responses are variable enough, have you guys thought about trying to predict who it's going to most help? Exactly. Yeah, we do. And that we, we, we still don't have enough numbers yet, but we're capturing the video phenotype, and we're doing it longitudinally as we intervene, as we give them the glass. So we have it on like 160 kids right now. We have the video phenotyping scores at three time points, at pre, post, and six weeks out from the randomized control trial. So we're starting to look at it and see if we can be predictive. And I think over time, as we gather the information, we will be able to do it. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.
Good morning, everyone. So first, I want to thank Terry for inviting me to give a Terry talk. And when she sent me the email and said, do you want to give a Terry talk? I said, what is a Terry talk? And she said, like a TED talk. But I made them up, so they're Terry talks. So I emailed back and said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And she said, whatever you want. I said, OK, whatever I want. She said, sure. I said, OK, I'm going to talk about mentoring. Um, I'm going to tell you in a minute why. But the title of this talk is something I've never given a talk like this before, so this is the first time. But it's uh, training the, the next generation of biomedical scientists in today's world. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this is that I feel like the amount of conversation around how hard it is to be a scientist and how miserable our lives have to be continues to propagate. And yet, a lot of us are actually pretty happy. I mean, look around the room. We are in Hawaii doing work. How miserable could we possibly be? And yet, if you look on Twitter, there's tons of conversation about the misery of science life. And that is being taught to the next generation. And a lot of them are choosing not to go into science because we keep telling them it's miserable. Now, some of you might be miserable. And, and I, I'm sorry if you are. Um, there is another way. You don't have to be miserable. But I want to give you some kind of the things that I've been thinking about that certainly have made me happy as a scientist, but I think have also made me successful as a mentor. And so for the trainees, these are things for you to think about as you go on and become mentors. For the mentors, maybe think about what you're doing, and maybe you like what you're doing. Don't change a thing if you think you're doing a great job. But maybe I will say something today that will make you think about how you do things and maybe do them differently. So why do I think that I should talk about this? Well, first, my trainees are very, ha very happy. I've trained 12 PhDs. Um, five more are in my lab right now. I've trained four postdocs. I have three more right now. They are happy while they're in the lab, and then years later, they come back and tell me how happy they are now. Some are tenured faculty at universities, some work for NIH, some work for companies, but they have figured out how to have good balance between work and life, and they say that they learned it in the lab. And so a lot of other people then ask me, how do you do it all? How do you make it happen? Um, I think part of that is figuring out what your definition of all is. So I can tell you, I do not play organized sports. I am a terrible cook. I cannot sew. I cannot paint. It looks like my 10-year-old paints something if I try. There are lots of things that I can't do. They also happen to be the things that I don't care that much about and I don't enjoy doing. So can I do it all? Yes. I do all of my science all of my administrative work, all of my mentoring work, my parenting, and the things that I enjoy. But that's because I prioritize and get rid of the things that don't matter to me. Um, and this Twitter conversation, I feel like, has really elevated in the last six months about how there's no training in mentorship. We don't teach people how to run a lab, whether it's industry, NIH, academic. We don't teach them how to run a lab. We don't teach them how to manage people or mentor people. We kind of learn it along the way. And I certainly had no books, no papers that I read, no formal training. I learned from great mentors who I kind of watched. And I watched when they did, did things well, and I watched when they didn't do things well. And I never wrote them down, and it's only really been the last six to 12 months that I've started to be able to formulate and put down in words what I think does work and doesn't work. Um, and that's why I wanted to start to talk about it. So, because my trainees are really happy, I've been thinking about, well, how do I reach more people? So one option is that I take more than five graduate students at a time, and I don't feel like I have the mental or emotional bandwidth to do that. I don't want to have 20 graduate students at a time. I don't think I'll be a good mentor then. And so instead, I've been thinking about how to start putting materials together to disseminate. So through papers or talks, or I'm even thinking about writing a book. Um, so just a minute about my background, just so that you understand where my story and my perspective comes from. Um, I am the first generation PhD in my family. My parents didn't go to, they didn't finish college. My mother didn't finish high school, she got her GED. My father went to college but never finished. So it was a really big deal that I went to college and went on to get my PhD. I grew up in Pittsburgh, blue collar family, kind of not a lot of money, pretty kind of low income neighborhood. Um, I went to the University of Pittsburgh in Johnstown for undergrad, 
not a fancy Ivy League school, a state school and a branch campus of a state school at that. Um, then I got into Vanderbilt for my PhD where I got my PhD and masters. I did not do a postdoc against the best advice of a lot of my mentors, some of whom are here, and said, you should do a postdoc. And I said, I don't want to do a postdoc. I'm not saying you shouldn't do a postdoc. I have three postdocs right now. It's a great thing if it's for you. It wasn't for me at the time. Um, and then I went from a faculty position at Vanderbilt. I did a faculty position at Penn State. I worked for a short time at Geisinger Health System, which is an industry or corporate job. And then now I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. So I've kind of tried lots of different things along my path. And I've learned lessons all along the way. So that's kind of where I get my, my views. So there are five key points that I want to make and things for you to think about. Um, I went to a really great workshop on how to give a great talk last fall. Um, I think I generally give a decent talk, but I'm a lifelong learner, so I still wanted to go and learn how do you give a great talk. And one of the woman's key points is that you should never tell people more than three things in a talk. I tried so hard to make this three points. I could not crunch them down or merge them together, so it's five. Uh, but she said, people cannot remember more than three things. And so if that is true, you choose which of the five, which three of the five you're going to remember, and you can ignore the other two. Um, maybe you'll remember all five, but if not, you pick your three. But I'm doing five because I, I, I couldn't distill it down. So um, the first is about the path. I think this is one of the most important things, especially for the trainees who maybe are not on the standard path or the typical path. There is not one path to get you into a successful career in science. And if someone tries to tell you that there is, they are just trying to make themselves feel better about the path that they took. There isn't one path. And what do I mean by that? OK, so the, the typical path, or certainly the path that I took. I got a STEM bachelor's degree. So my bachelor's was in biology. Then I went on to get a PhD in statistical genetics, and then I got a faculty position. That was my path. I didn't do the postdoc path. Um, some people get a master's in one thing, then they go and get a PhD. Some get a job, and they work out in the real world for a little while and realize they don't like the real world. They want to go back to school. So then they go get a master's degree, but maybe they try something in the arts. And then they realize, no, I want to go back to science. And so then they go get their PhD. And then they're like, you know what, I hate academia. I'm going to go do a postdoc in industry. And then they may end up in industry or government or academia. I've gone back and forth. It is possible. Um, some people start in liberal arts and then wish they had gone into science and try to figure out, how do I get into science now? I know people who have art degrees, music degrees, who are now successful PhDs in industry and in academia. So wherever you sit now in your training, so if you're a high school student, a college student, a PhD, even if you already have a PhD in one thing. So some people, you'll see the green kind of bounces, get two PhDs. They go for one in math and they decide later, I really want to learn more about computer science or biology or chemistry. All of those paths can lead you to be successful. You'll notice I did not talk about what that means, hooray, I'm a successful scientist. So whether that's industry, academia, government, it doesn't matter. The path that you take to get there is your own, and you need to figure out which path is the right one for you, and then what that end goal is for you. So this idea that the industry is the dark side and academia is the only true path, that, that's not true. I have tried both. For me personally, I'm an academic. I love to teach people and mentor people and watch them grow. And so the corporate side of the world isn't right for me. I have a lot of friends who love the corporate world. They're really into kind of seeing things go into market quickly and the numbers and the business side of it. I hate that part. I don't like balancing my checkbook. I, I don't want to worry about that kind, of, that kind of thing. So any path can get you there. You need to figure out which path is your path. And don't let people tell you that that path won't work. I will also say, though, they're not all easy. So this idea that you could go from you know, arts to science or academia to industry and then back to academia, it's not always easy. Sometimes you have to do a lot of work to get from one place to another. 
But that's on you. If you want that to happen, you figure out what it takes to do that, and you do it. And that's certainly what I've seen happen for me. Okay, the second one, basic necessities of life. This is the one that I was like, I probably don't need to tell people this. And then I was like, no. I actually added this back in because of a conversation I had with one of my graduate students right around finals time. Actually, two different graduate students around finals time this past fall. This may sound really simple, and probably to those of you who are over age 40, you're going to nod and go, yeah, I know. Those of you under 40 may not realize it. Sleep, nutritious food, water, and exercise. They are seriously important to allow you to be successful at work. So I was one of those college students who would pull all-nighters. I would eat junk. I would drink tons of coffee and eat lots of sweets, and then I would crash, and so I would have more coffee so that I could stay up all night and study for the test. And then later, I would crash. Um, as a junior faculty, I would stay up all night to finish my grant the night before the grant deadline. Why didn't I work on the grant weeks ahead? I knew when the deadline was, six months earlier. In fact, we always know. They're always the same, unless it's an RFA, but the grant deadlines don't change. And yet, the week of the grant, we're freaking out and we're staying up all night. Every time I do that, when I read the grant a week later just to see, I find so many stupid spelling mistakes and sentences that make no sense because I was half asleep while I was writing it. Um, if I eat like crap, I cannot focus. My brain is all over the place. I start flipping to Facebook and Instagram and Amazon shopping and I have a really hard time focusing if I don't eat. And I will say, I did not appreciate these things until I turned 40. So once I hit 40, if I don't get enough sleep, I am a disaster. If I don't eat well, I feel horrible for days. So for the youngins, you can probably keep doing it for a little while longer. You know, eat like crap, don't get any sleep, but it will catch up with you. And if you start sooner to think about these basic necessities, you will feel better and it will make you more productive. I don't want to say that it's not without coffee and chocolate and wine and beer and all of those fun things. Um, everything in moderation, but making sure that in addition to all your coffee or beer, that you're drinking water and eating healthy things is really important. Okay, the next one is time management. This one probably is the most important. Um, we all have the same amount of time, right? There are 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. None of us have a time machine. We cannot pause time. We cannot go back in time. Believe me, if I could go back in time, I would move my damn boot instead of trying to step over my boot, which is how I broke my ankle. I stepped on my own shoe that was sitting in the middle of the floor, and my ankle turned. And I yell at my kids all the time, don't leave your shoes in the middle of the floor. And when I fell, I started yelling, don't leave shoes in the middle of the floor. Learn from me, because I left my shoe in the middle of the floor. But if I could turn back time, I would have gone back 30 seconds and just picked up the boot and moved it before I walked across the room to put a box away. But I didn't. I can't. We don't have that luxury. So if we all have the same amount of time, why are some people so much more productive? I saw someone's tweet last week. Everybody was tweeting their um, productivity of 2018 stats. Somebody tweeted, and I can't even remember his name. He's from Cambridge, I think. Um, somewhere, I think it was Cambridge. He published, what did it say? 85 papers, 35 grants, graduated 17 PhDs, and a few other awards and things. And I thought, what? I don't know if he, maybe that's for a whole group or for a bunch of faculty, but I read it and for a moment, I was like, oh my gosh, I only published like 23 papers. Oh, how do you publish 85 papers? And I was like, wait, there's no way. And I started really fighting with myself and like comparing and getting competitive. And then I thought, no, no, maybe, maybe he did publish 85 papers a year. But if he published 85 papers, there were a lot of other things in life that he, he wasn't doing because there are the same number of hours in my day and in his day. And so you get to choose. Do you want to publish 85 papers, 20 papers, three papers? That's up to you. Of course, the journals have something to do with that too, but how much productivity you have and how many hours you spend depends on you. 
Um, and other people, I will notice on social media, are having so much more fun than I do. I constantly have FOMO, fear of missing out, because people are posting all these fun things. It's about managing your time. We have the same amount of time. It's up to you to choose what you do with it. So I saw this in a book earlier this year, this figure, um, about how time is actually, we actually have a lot more time, I think, than we think about. So the typical is about eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, and then eight other hours. And you might sit there and go, well, I only sleep for six, and I work for 12. So shift those a little bit. Um, but the reality is that there's a whole other chunk of hours that we are awake that we are not working, that we should, should and can be doing other things. Well, what do you do with this time? I will get to that one in just a minute. I wanna go back to sleep. I'm gonna say it again, because I think sleep is so important. Um, when you are sleep deprived, you will realize it most. And so if any of you have ever had an infant under your roof, whether it was your own, an adopted one, a family member's child, a friend's child, you know this. When you do not get to sleep, it is, really detrimental to your mood, to your ability to focus, and to your health. Um, there are many countries in this world, including ours, that use sleep deprivation as a form of torture. It is torture. It actually messes with your body's biochemistry. Now, whether you need eight hours or six or four, everybody's circadian clock is different. So we actually don't all need eight hours of sleep. But you need to figure out for you, what is your clock? Maybe you're a 10 hour night person, but maybe you're a four. But if you're an eight and you keep doing four, it will catch up with you and you will notice your focus, your health, and your mood will change. Um, I'm not gonna spend a ton more time on that other than to say, if you don't believe me, do some searching online in PubMed um, on health. And this, again, after 40, you really start thinking about these things because they start to happen. Maybe not the Alzheimer's quite yet, but some of the other things start to hit around 40. Um, lack of sleep really does cause disease. And so if you want to be able to work through your kind of later life, you need to get enough sleep. The other chunk of time is work. How many hours do you work? Eight, 10, 12, 14 hours a day? That's up to you. Um, to, no matter how many hours you work, um, there's a great book called High Performance Habits that I'll show you more about at the end. Um, Brendan Burchard says, 60% of your workday should be spent on your high priority projects. If you do that, you will be really productive. Um, I would challenge you to sit and look at your calendar over the course of a couple of weeks and see how often you spend 60% of your time on the things that are high priority to you. I tried this and I was really disappointed in myself because I spend a lot of time going to other people's meetings and other people's priorities rather than mine. Um, and so I've started to try to take control of that and block time for, you know, reading and editing my students' papers, writing my grant, focusing on my things, um, and then just trying to maximize your productive work time. So you know for yourself, are you really productive at 5 a.m.? I am. I'm a morning person, so I get up early and I work. Um, by 7 p.m., I am an idiot. I cannot put sentences together. I can't review a paper. It's a disaster. But I have a lot of people in my lab whose most productive time is after 9 p.m. And so I don't expect them to show up in lab at 7.30 or 8 o'clock because they're still sleeping. They were up till 3. So figuring out when is your productive time and making your calendar fit then. Um, getting rid of non-essentials and learning to say no. Those are really important. Um, I would say that in the jobs that we do, which are highly cerebral, so we are not factory workers. Most of us are not even wet lab workers that have to grow cells and wait and do an exercise and wait. Most of us are working on computers and thinking and reading. And I don't know about you, but for me, doing that for 10 hours in a row is not possible. I cannot keep my brain that focused for that long. I lose focus, I lose efficiency, and I know I make a ton of mistakes. And my creativity goes out the window. So I don't work for 10 hours in a row. I might work 10 hours in a day when I have a grant deadline, but some days, maybe it's six. I have really strong six hours and then I go do something else. So thinking about when you're productive. Um, for my lab, I do not encourage them to sit at their computers you know, for eight hours and watch the clock and go surf and do other things. I encourage them to do other things. Um, the other eight hours, what do you do? More work, more sleep, 
other things. That's up to you. But more importantly, what about the fringe hours? So this is not in that original chart. These are the pockets of time that you have in your day that you don't even think about. And I would challenge you to do this one or two days. Pay attention to what you do throughout your day. There will be times that you will be sitting around wasting time. I definitely caught this for myself. What kind of times are these when you're sitting in traffic, when you're riding on a train, you're waiting for a meeting, you're walking from one meeting to another, you're sitting at a kid's activity waiting. It's easy to pick up your phone and get on Facebook, go to Twitter, go to Amazon, do random things, and maybe that is good and relaxing for you. But I have found that reading a book, listening to a podcast, reviewing a paper, um, listening to a talk is way more productive with these little pockets of time. So I did this exercise. I was so disappointed at how many times I was just doing dumb things, playing, you know, crossword puzzles on my phone, that in that 15 minutes while I was waiting for something to start, I could have reviewed a paper, but I just didn't think to have it with me. Now I always have something to read, something to listen to, and something to work on with me. Um, number four, knowing yourself, your boss, and your team. And what do I mean by that? Everybody has different personality types and different strengths and weaknesses. There is not one type that's better. There are two tools that I would recommend that I have tried for myself. I have not done these with my lab yet, but I think we're going to this year. One is the Enneagram. This is a personality inventory that's used a lot in business management. There are nine types of people. We all have all of the types within us, but we emphasize or have a strength in one of them. So I am a type three, which is an achiever. And when I read the description of that, it is creepy how much this book can see into my soul. Um, and when I am under stress, I go to a nine, which means that I get very um, anxious and uh, angry and very quick. And, and this was very true about me. Um, but knowing this about myself helps me with my own behavior. But knowing, I don't know what all of my team members are, but I'm trying to be aware that what motivates them and drives them may not be what motivates or drives me. I will make the slides available because I'm not going to be able to read through all these. But just knowing things like, you know, I'm motivated by goals and achievements, whereas there are some people in my group who I know are more motivated by the challenge of something or controlling something. And so thinking about that, rather than trying to mentor everybody the way I can be effectively mentored, just doesn't work. DISC is the other type of survey. These are both available online, and I would encourage you to take a look at them. In DISC, it reflects your dominance, influence, conscientiousness, and steadiness. I have a high I. I'm an influencer. And if you know me, you would not be su surprised. So the label on my pattern is the persuader. And I would say that's true. I can convince people of lots of things. I'm a good salesman. So the key here is that it's important to meet people where they are. So last is balance. All of the things that I told you about come together by just doing everything in moderation. So you want to get all of the work done. You want to get all of the personal life things done. It may not be that in every day you can spend eight hours at work, eight hours on your family and friends, and eight hours on sleep. Maybe some days the shift is one way, but then the next day it's a different way. It's about getting balance on the whole. And this is really important for the next generation. This is a great article, which is why I want to make the slides available so people can look at this, about millennials. They are very different from us. Generation X, Generation Y, baby boomers, they grew up so differently from us. They are totally digital. They are always on. They look at their phone before their feet hit the floor in the morning. They do not get up and have coffee and do things and then get on a computer. Their phone is attached to their hands, which means that they are able to work 24 hours a day. That also means that it is a high priority to them to have balance in their lives. And so figuring out how we can make science appealing to them when they don't want to lose that balance, but it's so easy to happen because they're online all the time, is really important for us if we want them to stay in science. So I think we need to find that balance for them, but I think it's important for us as well. I feel like I've achieved that, and I have some colleagues who haven't, and they talk to me all the time about how miserable they are, and I've been trying to, to show them resources to look at to try to achieve some of that. So my last point, 
um, is a casket. I found a rose gold one online, which I was excited about. Um, Richard O'Brien was a faculty member at Vanderbilt. And at my tenure party, when I got tenure at Vanderbilt, he said, you know, this is so great. You got tenure so fast. You're so young. He said, I just want to give you one piece of advice. When you die, and at this point, by the way, I was maybe 38, th no, 36. I, I was young. Um, he said, when you die, what do you want surrounding you at your casket? Stacks of papers, all of the papers and grants that you've published and written and gotten funded, or friends and family and people who love you. And of course it's the second one, but that conversation has stuck with me. And I think about it every time I have to make a choice about, you know, am I going to do this thing for work or am I going to do this thing for my family? And there are times that I choose work. Work is the priority sometimes, and it has to be. Right now, my family is out at the beach hanging out. I am in here. And what um, Eve said to me this morning, I'm abandoning my family to be here at the meeting for the day. And that's true. I am. But I've been with them most of the week, so I'm okay with that for today. Um, there are resources out there, podcasts, books. Find the ones that resonate with you. Um, they will not all resonate with you. A couple of books I've read I've hated. These are books that I've really liked. I will just mention High Performance Habits is my favorite book for um, high achievement. And if you look at season four of his podcast, he reads the audiobook for free. So I paid $15 for the book on Audible, and I bought the book, and then I found out that it's on, or on his podcast for free. So if you don't want to buy it, but you're interested, if you go to his website and look at his podcast, it's free. So I will close with two quotes from two authors that I like. Not everyone will understand your journey, and that's fine. It's not their journey to make sense of, it's yours. And so that's an author, Zero Dean. I didn't put a cover of his book, but his book is also great. And then the last one, Rachel Hollis, who's one of my favorite authors right now, um, and she happens to be in Hawaii, but on Oahu, not here. Um, you and only you are ultimately responsible for who you become and how happy you are. We cannot blame other people if we're not happy. Um, I am a scientist, I run a lab, I mentor, I do it administration, and I have a family, and I'm happy. You don't have to be miserable in science. And so I'm hoping that this message got through and maybe three items you'll remember um, to try to kind of get the right work-life balance for yourselves. So thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Marilyn. Really nice talk. I agree with a lot of it. I, I wanted to ask about the part where you're talking about, you know, meetings that you're in to do things for other people. And I think a lot of us, especially who are faculty, have this issue to spend a lot of time in meetings that other people have requested. And yet, on the, the other hand, you know, I really feel like we, we can't just turn these things down. I mean, often I need those meetings from other people, right? I need people to be on my students' committees. I need Mm -hmm. advice from my grant. So, so getting to your last point about balance, how, how, how do you attain a balance in this sort of thing? Yeah, it's hard. Um, so one thing that I've started to do is to try to find out the purpose of the meeting and how long the meeting really needs to be. And, and certainly when I schedule them, I try to schedule them for shorter time, so 30 minute meetings instead of an hour, because let's be honest, we will all talk for as long as we have on the calendar to have a meeting, right? Like people fill the meeting generally. So I try to keep them shorter. Um, I try to not go to as many other things that aren't relevant. So at Penn, you could go to a seminar every hour of every day because there's so many seminars. I go through the calendar and pick and choose the ones that are great because, and I look at, okay, I have to, there's two student committees that I need to do this week. I need to do a project for, or a meeting for my grant. I need to meet with my lab. And so I try to just look through and pick the ones that are most important. And then the key, I think, is blocking time. So if you take a look now at next month and block time on your calendar for the things you need to do, then when you fill in the meetings, you'll have that time still left, which is something I didn't used to do. This is a new thing, and it's working. Nice talk. Uh, I am uniquely um, positioned to comment on this since I was your first graduate student. Mm -hmm. um, Indeed. I, I will testify to the fact that I am, in fact, happy. Uh, how can you not be here? Right? <laughs> uh, one of the things that I did learn, everything that you've said is absolutely true. One of the things that I did, I think, learn from you um, almost through osmosis is how to deal with stress. 
And so one of the things that I think trainees see uh, from us in particular is that we seem like we're stressed all the time and even as they progress through their own careers, they learn to deal with you know, different types of stress from exams or publications or whatever else. And, um, I think you sort of just adjust, right? I mean, comment, that maybe you can comment on how you deal with stress. I mean, for me going through things, it's like you, you just, as you come across something new um, in your professional career that you have to do, hire someone, fire someone, lay someone off, whatever, you just sort of embrace it, you are stressed in the moment, and then the next time you do it, it's not that big a deal, right? Mm -hmm. No, so. that's so true, that's a great point. Um, I think, well, one, figuring out what you do to relieve that stress, because it, it will be stressful. I mean, every time I have to fire someone, it's stressful. It, I, I hate it every time. But I also know that I should not schedule an important meeting with a student right after that meeting. I need to take 30 minutes, go for a walk, go get a cup of coffee, listen to some music, something to de-stress. So we will all have those stressful times, and the key is to figure out what you do that makes you bring down the stress kind of right afterwards so that you deal with the stress, but then you bounce back from it, and, and I think that's important. Um, that actually reminds me, I had mentioned during the talk that um, the, the sleep issue and nutrition came up with my students. So two students during finals, well, actually, one during midterms got really sick right afterwards, and it's because she was eating like crap and not sleeping. And she said, I learned from that. And so finals time, I made sure I'm sleeping and eating and I'm skipping other things. So she's not maybe going to a thing with friends or she's not working out because she's sleeping and eating while she studies. And another student, another faculty member said, well, it's finals. I mean, this is the time where you eat like shit and don't get any sleep, but you'll get through it. And I was like, no, this is the time where you have to eat healthy things and sleep so that you don't fail your exams. But do not listen to him. I mean, we were in the room together and he was like, come on. And I was like, no, that message is exactly what I'm trying to stop. I mean, you have to know it for yourself. When you have gone into an exam, sleep deprived, you read the questions and it's like they come off the page into your face. Like, you cannot actually think that you're going to do great on an exam when you stayed up all night. It just, that is not possible. So, all right. So thank you, Lana. I'm sorry, Larry's cutting me off. Uh, yeah, sorry. I uh, hope okay. I can sneak in one last question. <laughs> so, uh, all right, Larry. Uh, as you know that I just recently changed my institute from University of Hawaii to University of Michigan, which is a totally different environment and a different scale of a university medical school. And uh, I was put on this additional job thing to manage the bioinformatics core as a faculty core director. Uh, so I found myself conf constantly in the conflict zone of, uh, like you mentioned too, you know, m my own research versus, uh, you know, helping other PIs, uh, their projects, and managing the core. To me, it, it was constantly a battle you know, how I utilize my time. My time was really limited. I was trying to build my team too. So I needed time for my, my own group. But at the same time, there are other people's business. You have to be there for them, meeting and stuff like that. So how, how do you strike the balance for the given amount of time that you, you, you know, fixed amount of time you have? Yeah, it's so hard and especially, I've done that. So I started a faculty position and started running a core um, not too long afterwards. Um, I've done that actually twice in my career. Um, and it is hard. I think back to the point I made about like really looking at your calendar and blocking times so that you're in control of, okay, so if you're most productive in terms of writing in the morning, then take two mornings a week and block that for your time or pick whatever time it is that you're productive. And that's your lab time to focus on your stuff. And then do the core things. At, it's not that you're not productive in the afternoon, but maybe that's just not your best writing time. And so do the core meetings then. But I think trying to really keep control of your calendar so that you, you do both. And you know, making sure that somebody else's, wait, what is the saying? Somebody else's lack of planning does not make it an emergency for you. I think is important. So there are times when I ran the core that people would be like, no, I need it today. The grant is due next week. I need it today. And it's something that they should have talked to the core three months earlier. Like you can't get the analysis done in a week. It's just not possible. Um, so I think being honest about what's possible and not, not overselling what the core can do. I made that mistake a few times. I'm like, no, we'll do it. We can do it. And 
if it's not realistic, just be honest about that. Um, I think setting some um, rules of engagement with the core is also helpful. So um, we started to do things when I ran a core that you know you you had to give a certain amount of lead time for a project. Um, you had to give a certain amount of information before we would have the meetings, so that because you'd end up in lots of meetings, and I'm sure this has happened where, like, oh, not all the people were there to actually get anything done, and so it ends up a wasted 30 minutes instead of a productive 30 minutes. So I think as much as you can take control of your calendar, because your time is the most valuable thing that you have, you know, more so than your money, it, it's your time. Because with time you can make more money, but with money you can't buy more time. So Think t looking at your calendar and focusing that time as best you can. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.